the H2O. Uh, we do education on water conservation and water reuse through a thorough knowledge of your watersheds. Uh, we have great partners for this. It's a, a Green Belt Alliance, as Zoe, who is running the meeting and organizes the uh, live streams from a tech standpoint, is um, helping us today and does a great job. And then uh, for this set, we're also uh, partnering with Friends of Salsa Creek, which has been phenomenal in helping us get into the knowledge base. So I just want to start. Here we are on the uh, Oakland estuary. Uh, we are on, so if you wouldn't mind showing that map. We are in Huchen Ohlone territory here. And uh, Zoe will show you the map in a second of what that looks like. So a lot of people think the Ohlone are just, you know, it's just, a, that's the one name for the peoples that lived here. And really in a sense, it's not exactly a generic name, but almost uh, replacing uh, the mis misnamed Costanoans by the Spanish. And then within Ohlone, there's a lot of different tribelets who lived all throughout the Bay Area. So just want to be clear that Ohlone, in where we are right now is the Huchin territory. It's a sovereign territory and uh, we support the Ohlone in their efforts to repatriate their lands. And uh, we personally, uh, meaning Holy H2O and, and this set of organizations, pay a Shumi tax. And what that means is we pay a tax for standing on this land and doing this presentation to the Ohlone at Segorite and encourage you all to look into Segorite and to, into the Shumi tax and uh, consider yourselves paying a Shumi tax if you're here in the East Bay or in the Bay Area. Okay, here we are at the mouth of Sausal Creek. It's super exciting. Uh, so we'll be here at the estuary today. We've got a, a host of really, really informed people who are gonna give us some history and some present day information about this awesome watershed. We're gonna start with Devin, Dennis Evanowski, who's a historian uh, who does a lot of tours and he'll introduce himself, take it away. Dennis, actually, he's gonna be using my phone. Thank you. There you go. Okay, so can, I, can you see me guys? Yeah, yeah we can see you. You have to plug your... Sweet. You have to plug Oh, in. you got it, yeah. All right. There you go. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm gonna hang on. I'm gonna put this one down <clears throat> and that one down. Go. Oh. All right, hang on a minute. It's not working. Mark, why don't you go well, Dennis? I can, I, I can, I'll just hold the phone. I'll just hold it. I'm not sure what's going on. I, I, I don't see anything on the phone okay. right now. Mark, go ahead. You don't have the video on. What I, I didn't do anything. I just, I know the video's on. We can see and hear you. Should we move, should we come back to Dennis? All right, well, thanks everyone for hanging in there with us. All right, 
Dennis is on mute. Um, let's see. Unmute. There we go. Are you waiting for me? Okay, so I'll, I'll start. Hi, I'm, I'm Dennis Novanoski and I'm a local historian. And I'd like to start my story with some very ancient history. Uh, last Thursday morning, when uh, we woke up uh, at 6.20 to find out that there was a water main break near where we lived. I go in, I go to turn the water on, nothing. I go in the bathroom or the kitchen to make coffee, nothing, no water. My wife gets dressed and says, I'm going to Lincoln Square to get some water. And off she goes and she comes back and we have our valuable, valuable commodity of water. I can wash my face, brush my teeth, drink my coffee. And th th this water is so valuable to all the creatures, all of us here. And the first peoples to realize this arrived here about 2,500 years ago, the Huchin uh, tribe, the Ohlone tribe, uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's a, there were 58 different small tribes within the Ohlone nation, and the Huchins were but one of them. Uh, they arrived here and they discovered that nature had provided a wonderful source of water in four different ways. Uh, the first is the, is the uh, what was uh, called for the longest time East, East Creek, which is uh, today Lion Creek. And also, Stand back a little bit so uh, can see and also San Leandro Creek, which uh, flowed into and helped create San Leandro Bay. And the other two creeks, uh, more akin to our neighborhood where we live here, are uh, Sousal Creek, which uh, flowed out of the Redwoods, and then uh, Peralta Creek, Creek, which has its headwaters about where Holy Names, uh, uh, excuse me, where the Mormon Temple is today. The, all these creeks came down uh, and sought uh, the, the San Leandro Bay and found the San Leandro Bay. The important thing that happened with Salsa Creek, however, is that it, it, looking for the place of least resistance, it made a sharp left and it started depositing all this wonderful alluvium uh, on its way to San Leandro Bay. And the alluvium, in the alluvium grew tule reeds, in the alluvium grew willow trees, uh, in the alluvium lived uh, all sorts of birds and their eggs, and this was very, very attractive to the Huchin. And they lived here seasonally. They didn't live here all year round, but they lived here seasonally. They used the willow and the tule to make their boats and their homes. They also discovered something very wonderful as they walked out to the San Francisco Bay, and that is uh, oysters. And they enjoyed the oysters so much they began accumulating them. Uh, on Alameda, we have evidence of about eight different shell mounds. The biggest one on Mound Street, uh, when it was uncovered, it, we discovered that it was more valuable than we thought. It, 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 was a, it was a cemetery. It held 450 bodies. It held 450 bodies, and it also, uh, it also had all, all kinds of grave goods. And on your screen right now, you can see how the Ohlone the, in this case, the Huchins used the, uh, the, the, the resources here. The, you can see the, the Tule boat there. You can see their home made out of willow and how they use their resources here to live. They stayed here for about 2,500 years. Uh, uh, okay, rather, they came here about 2,500 years ago and they stayed here all alone uh, with their own business, with their other tribes around them until 1770. In 1769, the Spanish came here, and over on the peninsula, they discovered the uh, San Francisco Bay. And the following year, they decided to explore this side of the bay. Unfortunately, they did it in November and December. It was a little bit cold, probably raining, and they decided to turn back. But two years later, in 1772, they arrived, and they began to pay attention to and map all the sources of the water. In the diaries, we find San Leandro Bay, uh, excuse me, San Leandro Creek, we find, uh, we find uh, San Lorenzo Creek, and we find a creek named for the forest, the Aurora del Bosque, which is, uh, became uh, later on known for, as Salsa Creek for the salsa tree, for the uh, willow trees right of the group, right about where the barge station is today. When they came, they decided that they were going to uh, 
do something to bring the Native Americans here together in a, in, 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 in a very, very cruel way. And, and what they did was they waited 20 years before they finally got around to doing it. They founded the Pueblo de San Jose in 1777. And then 20 years later, 1797, they come over here, they start a mission and they start rounding up all of the Huchins and the other tribes. And by 1802, there was a kind of a sad mention in the, in the, in the baptismal records that all the heathens were gone. And the sad thing that happened here is that th these, these people either fled, died of disease, or were incorporated into the mission system. And this happened uh, through the early part of the 19th century. And then finally, uh, right at uh, 1821, uh, Mexico took over and, uh, and, and, the, and the Spanish left. And just a year before that, uh, Luis Maria Peralta got this entire huge uh, land grant and he sent his son Antonio here. And Antonio lived between two of our creeks, Par Peralta Creek, he lived right next to Peralta Creek, the creek that bears a family name. And he also used Sassel Creek uh, as, a, as, as a resource. The, the uh, Peraltas, uh, lived here, grazed their cattle, uh, pretty much unmolested uh, until about 1844. And the French of all people show up. And there's a man named Demophorus. And if there's a, 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 a wonderful map, that, a, 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 a detail of the map that Demophorus made a, a, on the screen now, where it's the creeks are labeled San Antonio and San Leandro. And you can see uh, on the bottom of the map what is now Bay Farm Island. And then just below the, uh, above the word San Leandro, uh, a, a little bit of a, a lake in that, that's where Alameda is today. And what's really interesting on the right side of the map, there's a bullseye and it says Redwoods in French. And the French came here, they were probably ship jumpers and the, they did three things to start three different industries. The first thing they did was they went into the Redwoods right where Sequoia Lodge is, near Palo uh, uh, Seco Creek, they started a sawmill. Just here, exactly here where I'm standing, they started making bricks. And indeed, the alluvium created by the, by the uh, uh, Salsa Creek became known as Brickyard Slough. And in order to make the bricks, and in order to uh, be able to refine the gold that was coming in by 1852, 1853. There were the, the third set of Frenchmen and they were over on what is now uh, Alameda, the town of the city of Alameda, and they were making charcoal. So the French were pretty busy. In the meantime, the Yankees came. Four years after Duflo uh, de Matra made his map, the uh, uh, gold was struck and it was pretty much uh, the end of the time for the uh, Huching to be here. Of course, there were some here that, 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 that remained, but most of them, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it, around 1820 were gone, but now they, they were indeed all, no, they were all no longer with us uh, in, in, this, in this area. And after the gold rush came, the, the, or the gold, the, the, the gold rush folks came, the, the um, Peralta started selling his land. Antonio Peralta started selling his land against his father's wishes. And some of the land he sold, uh, he sold the entire uh, Alameda Peninsula for the tidy sum of $14,000. <laughs> so you can't even get, make a down payment on the house today in Alameda for 14,000. He bought the whole thing for $14,000, uh, settled in. And at, at first things didn't go very well here. Uh, the weather wasn't too good. It, the um, the uh, uh, estuary, as we know it today, uh, uh, didn't exist. The waters on the other side of Park Street Bridge tilted up a lot. And in 19, 1860 and 61, the rains came and flooded everything and flooded everybody out. Once that was over, uh, people started coming back. And the last thing I want to talk about is in 1874, they came up with this brilliant plan where they were going to cut through the land about where the Park Street Bridge is all the way over to where to where the um, to, to where the uh, High Street Bridge is and beyond and they were going to create an estuary 
And here's the brilliant part. They were going to put a dam out in San Leandro Bay, and then they're going to open the dam up when there was high tide, and the water was going to whoosh through the estuary and clean everything out. And I always like to say that you will never see San, Le San Leandro Bay whooshing anywhere. It'll never happen, first of all. And second of all, uh, they kind of uh, left out the part where when high tide is coming in onto San Leandro Bay, it's also coming into the estuary. So it worked against itself. They never built, they never built the bridge or the dam rather. And then finally, they put the estuary through and cut through in 1901. And I want to end with something that I find to be very interesting. One of my favorite things, stories to tell, history stories to tell, is if you ever go to the High Street Bridge and you look out across into the San Leandro Bay, you will see a big uh, green boy in the middle of the water. And, the, and that boy is there because there are, there's the remains of a bridge uh, uh, that, that they took across. And so I don't know if you can, I'm not sure if you can find the, the, the picture of the two guys sitting by the bridge. And this was, this was taken before they, um, before they, they put the estuary through in 1898. There they are right there, by the way. So if you can stop right there just for a second. There they are right there creating the estuary uh, with locomotives and shovels, bringing the dirt out. Uh, it also, by the way, rained like the devil uh, a couple times when they're trying to do this. So, but the, the, the story I wanted to tell was about that bridge out there and the two gentlemen sitting at the bridge. And it's almost the last picture I have in the, in, in, in the collection. And uh, you can look out across the way and you can see the old Melrose School at, at that bridge that used to be up where Larms is now. And uh, it just, uh, and to see, to appreciate the amazing change that went through here when, uh, when they finally cut the estuary through. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dennis. That was great. But, she introduced up, Cynthia. I believe we have Cynthia. So. Okay. All right, am I, am I, and I'm on? You're on, we can see right. you. So can I'm, you? I'm yeah. Cynthia. Um, I'm standing on the uh, 500 block of Peterson in Jingletown. And uh, behind me is the uh, mosaic of the Guadalupe. Um, uh, I've been in the neighborhood for 20 years. And 10 years ago, my creative um, uh, uh, artist, artistic volunteer, slash, I'll do anything, Jill McLennan and I got together and decided to turn what was a dump site, uh, a, a homeless encampment, a place where they dumped dead dogs after fights every Friday and Saturday night, and we turned it into a art wall of 10 to 12 artist uh, murals done by local artists. Uh, we worked with Saltall Creek to get plants uh, that are native to the Saltall Creek Plain and uh, started back in 2009 and right now it's a, a destination point for a lot of people who want to come and see the history of the neighborhood and also uh, artist uh, work. Um, one of the things about the pattern of the uh, art wall and garden is that uh, we are standing on the Salzall Creek Plain. Uh, Salzall Creek was culverted down International and down Fruitvale into the estuary years ago. But what we did is we have uh, plants on both sides of a uh, creek, a, a path that's like meanders like a creek. Uh, and then you can walk along and see Oakland native plants and the uh, murals and um oh Cynthia, uh, actually what, what the murals are or what the mosaics are okay so uh i think that you can see behind me is the guadalupe it was the very first mural that was put in place um this was a wall that was tagged by gangs constantly the second we put up the guadalupe the, the gang tags stopped completely then we started to get local artists to do other kinds of murals. I think if you can see that, that's Jill's mural. Um, I think uh, this one, other one was done by Carlos. It's actually a map of Jingletown. 
And then this mural was done by uh, Greg and Alexa, which is sort of a compilation of everything that Jingletown is. Um, uh, Voila Juice, uh, the White Elephant Sale, the Fruitvale Bridge, um, and uh, they left the Alameda side as native, and you won't, you can't, I don't think you can really see it, but there's some native, um, uh, Native Americans uh, painted in the background behind the Fruitvale Bridge. Okay. How's that? Great. Thank Should you. Cynthia. Should I pick up from there then? Or sure, yeah. Sure. Hello? Hello. Hi. Um can I am I spotlighted or should I uh, you're about to be spotlighted. Okay. There you go. Um, so I've been Cheryl McLennan. I'm Cynthia's um, partner in Neighborhood Projects, and um, I was just going to talk a little bit more about the murals on this wall because I helped organize um, the artists to paint the murals. Um, behind me, I have a mural of um, that was done, designed by myself with the um, students of Arise High School, which is located in the Fruitvale Plaza um, under a cultural funding grant from the City of Oakland. Um, and we designed the mural to start at the head of the Sawsaw Creek here um, and then come down. And as the creek is actually goes underground at Fruitvale Avenue here. So we have then kind of combined in the mural to go into the street and then into some of the culture of the Fruitvale neighborhood. Um, for the students, it was really important to include the cultural aspects of the neighborhood and we did that um, in a symbolic way using these Aztec um, insects and birds. Let's see if I can show you the eagle is kind of here in the middle of the street. Um, there's a lot of plants here as you can see and then there's a um, fly up in the on the sky and then it comes down into the um, Fruitvale Plaza right here which is where their school is located so that's kind of the center for the students um, and yeah so that's part of the mural this was the last mural that we did on the wall um, we also have a chalk wall at the end here which anybody can express themselves in the neighborhood that leaves it um, because we talked about the taggers um, that gives the um, neighborhood a place to express themselves rather than tagging they can draw on the chalk wall um, and one more thing about the native plants, I can show you. Um, we actually chose, there's a lot of fuchsias blooming right now. We actually chose um, native plants from the chaparral region that are um, drought resistant to um, grow here because we don't have a, a water source. Um, and they, it's, um, it's through a partnership with the Friends of Sawsaw Creek and they help us replenish and provide volunteers to help with maintaining the garden, which we've been growing for 10 years. So um, I think, yeah, I just wanted to show you one more mural here at the end, or maybe we can go down to the, um, the mosaic. And for later on, we'll be doing a live stream that includes the community uh, garden, or it's not a community garden, excuse me, the nursery that Friends of Sossel Creek uh, oh, runs in order to create all these different yeah, all right. gardens here and around the watershed. So we'll get there later on. Yeah. Um, also, I just wanted to point out that Jill uh, <clears throat> has done all sorts of great stuff. She's just showing you, and, and, and Cynthia, small smattering, but we um, were doing a project called Walk and Chalk, where we were going to chalk the entire of Sossel Creek where it's below ground and chalk it on the ground above ground. And as we were mapping out where it was and looking at Google Earth from above, we got to Achieve Academy, which is just a little bit uh, uh, up the watershed. And they had already drawn it through their campus. It was really cool, just like on their own, they decided to do it, I guess. So I'm not sure if they work with Friends of Sausal Creek on that or not. Okay, thanks. 
Sure. Um, and then later, Cynthia and I are going to talk about our another project we're working on. Um, but we did one of the murals is here on the, um, well, this is the, the dog mural, which is a, a bunch of community. It's all the dogs in the um, community. And it was actually a fundraiser. So you could pay to include your dog on the um, wall. And that would be a donation to the neighborhood project. So this is just the first of our um, storm drain murals, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So I'll just show you. Just it's a little faded now, but if I can kind of. It's modeled after a, a quilt style. So that's it. And we'll talk about those in a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Jill. Yeah. Next up. I think we're, oh, sorry. No, go for it, Elizabeth. Uh, Next up is uh, Mark Rousen, who's with Friends of Sausal Creek and many other things. He teaches geology and he'll tell you more about himself and also about the birds of this area, plus plenty more, I'm sure, ecologically. Is Mark here? Mark, I see you, but we can't see or hear you. Mute. All right, I've unmuted Mark. Yeah. Okay. And you can see him. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mark was on here. I'm. Uh, Hold on, Mark, you're sideways. Could we turn your your camera, perhaps? Uh, I'm sideways. It's crowned. Why don't you hold it? Yeah, Perfect. hi, I'm Mark Rizan with the Friends of Sausal Creek, and I wanted to uh, just point out, we've heard some great ideas uh, and, and, and art and sculpture. Here is the uh, Fruitvale Bridge, which really is a, a living sculpture. Why? Because it's a defunct railroad bridge, but it's the home of the Fruitvale Falcons. Uh, and it may sound like a sports team, and it may be a, a, a good mascot for the Friends of Sausal Creek, but uh, incidentally, the Sausal Creek is almost 25 years old, and I've been monitoring birds here for, for uh, quite a while. And in the year of 2006, peregrine falcons started to show up here on the bridge. And that itself is a story. For many, many years, falcons were in, on the endangered species list because of uh, DDT. DDT uh, thins out their eggshells and their eggshells then would be too thin for them to sit on. And the uh, eggs would then be crushed by the weight of the parent. So uh, outlaw DDT, uh, that allowed the birds to start to build up, but it was not until a lot of human intervention uh, got going. Uh, in the early days, there was only two, three pairs nesting in the entire state. Now, the habitat is almost completely uh, saturated. And our birds are monitored and managed by the University of California's Santa Cruz Pre uh, Predatory Bird Research Group. And they monitor every year when the falcons return. Uh, they make sure the chicks don't uh, harm themselves when they are fledging, and they ban these birds. So if I could have the first picture here, We've had a, uh, a buildup of these species uh, due to these husbandry issues uh, where eggs were taken from nests. Uh, the nests, uh, the eggs were uh, reared by uh, the chicks. I'm sorry, the eggs were reared in incubators and then re-released uh, into the wild. Uh, females were inseminated uh, with other males and all of this is no longer necessary. And that's the wonderful thing because uh, the, as I mentioned, this was so successful that this is now really uh, not even uh, permitted anymore. Because of this, next slide, there's a lot of food. They were able to take advantage of the pigeons as a prey base. And here in Fruitvale, there's a lot of pigeons and peregrine falcons are almost exclusive. 
uh, bird eaters. You may have heard they're the fastest bird alive. They can uh, stoop or uh, dive on a bird up to 180 miles an hour and knock the bird out of the air or at least uh, grab it with their talons. So what would happen then? The birds would uh, move on to the bridge. Let's see if we have the next slide. And bring the pigeon back to the uh, female or to the chicks. Uh, they would be defeathered and slowly uh, eaten. Next slide, please. The chicks would be, uh, the nests are, or iries are placed in the corners of the bridges. The old nooks and crannies of the ironwork provides cool shade uh, during the hot summer months. So uh, the nests are, uh, this is a bird perching, but the nests are uh, out of the, out of the uh, sun. Maybe it's on the next slide here. Yeah, so there you see them in the uh, corners where they can get shade. Uh, they don't make a nest, they just lay their eggs on gravel or uh, uh, detritus and the up to four eggs are laid and um, sometimes in good years up to four uh, birds are uh, hatched. Next please. It's dangerous though to live on a bridge. So you have to be able to uh, learn how to fly quickly and not fall into traffic. Here's some uh, an adult luring the young birds out of the nest with food and making them fly, having them uh, be highly motivated by starving them for a couple of days and then uh, moving them, trying to get them to uh, learn how to fly so they can get their lunch time. Next, please. I said, uh, uh, here's a parent kind of coming in with some food, trying to uh, lure the chicks uh, into uh, taking their flight or their first flight. Uh, a bird that has just uh, been living on a bridge needs to learn how to build up its flight muscles. That will take uh, a lot of uh, working out and exercise. In uh, 2020, last year, we had four chicks raised here. That was a, a super, super year. And uh, three males and one females. Again, the Santa Cruz uh, Predatory Bird Research Group uh, monitored that. Uh, during the fletching time, people are here uh, all day long making sure that the Chicks don't fall into traffic or uh, get into uh, harm's way. Nevertheless, one of the young chicks did uh, fly into a window in Jack London Square and was taken into uh, Lindsay Wildlife Rehab. Next, please. That bird actually ended up having uh, some disease. Well, as I showed you earlier, uh, these birds are eating pigeons, and it turns out that occasionally they take racing pigeons. And uh, this is a sad story. Um, the parent showed the young one where to find the racing pigeons and a uh, person shot the juvenile and the female. And it was sad, but luckily the birds were recovered. Turns out that the uh, juvenile could not uh, have its wing repaired, so it went into captivity. But the female was rehabbed at Lindsay and then taken up the Delta and released. Well, the bird made a beeline back for its original spot at its nest and it turns out that another female had moved into its position during the time it was in the hospital. So uh, that was not good. But the bird, uh, the female then was beat up by the new female and the new female then took over uh, and continued to raise uh, chicks. Well, um, next slide please. I think I'm coming to the end. Here they are with uh, the uh, food passing. Uh, they pass uh, food to each other. Uh, parents feed each other and uh, feed it to their chicks. Uh, it allows uh, access into the intimate life of peregrines that you really don't see anywhere uh, like this. You can stand on the bridge and these birds, next slide, will be overhead in the I-beams. And uh, here they are at the top of the bridge tower. So uh, come maybe next, uh, 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 maybe late February, early March, they'll start to nest and they'll be done nesting uh, pretty much by the end of uh, June and fledging. So I'm going to leave it here. I think uh, my phone's telling me I'm running out of battery, so I don't want to uh, drop off. Maybe one more slide. Yeah, good. So there you say, this is why it's a living sculpture. There you have living birds taking advantage of a artifact of the industrial uh, Fruitvale, Oakland area uh, for the last 15 years and hopefully for another 15. Thank you very much. All right.
Thank you, Mark. Next up, we have Cynthia and J Jill to talk about the storm drains that they, they mentioned previously, that they touched on. But all right. Hi, Cynthia. You are muted. I'm going to unmute you. I think I'm, I'm unmuted now. Perfect. There you go. All right. Uh, I'm in a different part of the neighborhood. Jill and I jumped on our bikes and ran over here. We are uh, in front of a storm drain mural. I hope that you can kind of see it. Um, we, uh, I'm actually going to move my camera a little bit. We are right on the estuary, as you can see. And one of the things after living in Jingletown for 20 years, I noticed that um, people just treated the storm drains as if it was like a sewer line and they would throw stuff in constantly. And Jill and I are always thinking about ways to bring art to the neighborhood. The mayor approached us about a grant um, for preparedness. And I said, how about storm drain uh, awareness? And Jill was able to get a bunch of people together. We painted four storm drains. This one that we're at right now was painted uh, August 2019 by the um, uh, seniors who live at the cooperative building uh, right next to this, uh, Phoenix Commons, they came out and they painted this mural to, um, you know, bring awareness to the storm drain that is right there. Um, so, Jill, you want to go ahead? So, hi again. Um, Jill here. So I helped design this mural with the art club um, at the senior co-housing building here. And they came up with the idea of um, painting sea creatures. And then I just sort of designed the layout and got lots of prepared lots of images of sea creatures. Um, and then people came out all day and chose a sea creature and added it to our ocean that, that drains, that goes between two drains actually. There's one kind of right here and then it starts with the kelp forest, and then it goes into kind of the deep sea, and then the, and then sort of the um, creatures that live near the top of the water. And then everybody, we had over 25 participants in one hot August day um, from the ages of about six to almost 100. So that was really amazing neighborhood turnout. And I wanted to talk about one other mural that um, Zoe has some slides of. It's another storm drain project that um, was successful in the making, but then hasn't really lasted as successfully in the neighborhood. Um, we worked with some students. Yeah, you can, um, at um, Lazier, the eighth grade came down to the neighborhood. They walked here and I prepared these um, kind of rivers and they, the kids all planned out and painted a fish from either fresh water or salt water kind of estuary um, environment. Here's some girls painting their fish that they had practiced um, back in the classroom with me. And then they came out and they painted them onto the sidewalk. Um, unfortunately, um, within a few weeks of painting the mural, the neighborhood, um, that area is just really, has a lot of people coming and going and it, um, once again, as Cynthia was saying, the drain was not being respected as an environmental um, source and the mural was soon very dirty and faded. So there's a couple more slides that show what it looks like today. Um, so we moved some of the mural up onto the sidewalk and that part has lasted a little longer. Um, and I, it was a learning, um, lesson for us that in the future we'll choose kind of we want to promote um, bringing bringing attention to these high traffic areas and to stop people from throwing trash in the drain so we really need to kind of brainstorm with the students how we can communicate our message in a more effective way next time that's all thanks thank you Jill and Cynthia yep. Elizabeth Muted, I'm unmuting you. It doesn't 
Can you unmute yourself? It's not letting me unmute you for some reason. Okay, sorry about that. My phone's being very persnickety today. Um, Cynthia and I were gonna just talk briefly about um, the homeless encampment and impact on water quality. Cynthia, are you there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, I don't know if you wanted to kind of take the lead on that, so you, since you know more about it than I do, and then I'll just throw in some info. Well, one of the things that uh, a lot of you have seen today is, um, uh, you know, some of the art and the beauty of this neighborhood. Uh, we're also in an industrial warehouse area. And because of uh, economic issues, we've got a lot of homeless. The homeless feel um, that they uh, are safer if they're in a warehouse area where they're not bothering um, homes, residential homes. And one of the, uh, is one of the areas that the street residents have now taken over is uh, on Alameda Avenue on the other side of Park Street Bridge. Um, and I'm getting a telephone call. Um, so <laughs> so uh, uh, along the Alameda Avenue is the Bay Trail and people like to walk the Bay Trail. They like to ride the Bay Trail, but unfortunately our uh, street campers are starting to go over to the sidewalk area, park their cars, do um, uh, car repair. There's a couple of tents there. Um, I can't say, uh, you know, I can't speak to, you know, the economic issues, but some of the problems are that some of these people are um, just trashing the environment. Just like the kids party down at the end of Derby on Jill's mural, they just throw garbage and trash. And we've been trying to clean it up. I've gone and spoken to some of the um, residents. I know them by name. I know their history. But they just have really no place to move. Um, and unfortunately, they are affecting the estuary, the embankment, um, and again, using the storm drains for their trash and brown water. Do you have any questions? This is a really interesting side effect of the um, ongoing economic issues that are happening, you know, particularly in the Bay Area, but obviously all around the United States, the income disparity. It's largely people of color that are being put out um, and older folks. And they really can impact the water quality. So I learned uh, that the city of Oakland was uh, gonna lose its large funding to take care of the estuary because they could not guarantee the water quality anymore because there was so much human sewage being dumped in. I know in my neighborhood, uh, the homeless encampments have grown quite a bit since COVID started um, and have uh, really pushed out. And that is also true here. And so we're not blaming the homeless. I just wanna be super clear. I'm not blaming homeless people at all because, or the unhomed, uh, because everybody, I, I like uh, Cynthia, have met a lot of folks and have heard their stories and understand them. And so what we need to do is work on both climate change issues and economic issues uh, in order to help solve the homelessness issue, which is impacting water quality. So there's a lot of things you know, un unintended consequences that happen. Uh, and it just reminds us that all the things are linked together. You know, the thigh bones connected to the, whatever the next bone is. My sister should be here to tell us. So I think that's it. I thanks everybody for hanging in there through our technical difficulties on this one. I'm, I, I apologize. Um, but uh, there was so much good information and I learned personally a ton. I'm not the expert, I just assemble the experts. So, yeah. um, Elizabeth? Zoe. Elizabeth? Yeah, and there were a few questions. So if anybody, we can take a few minutes now to answer any questions. There were a few in the chat, um, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them now. And just I unmute yourself to get into the conversation. I have a comment People and a question. Asking questions. Yeah, go for it, John. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is John Steer. I'm Watership Planner for Contra Costa County. 
also a longtime Creek activist. Wanted to mention with respect to the homeless issues, um, here in Contra Costa County, uh, we've initiated, I helped to do it, a core Creeks program where we work with a, a watershed team that goes out and um, they work with the homeless and they have them pick up trash along the creeks where they live. And this has really helped a lot. We've, um, they, we actually pay the uh, homeless um, kind of outreach team, engagement team to do this. And it's been very successful. You, um, a similar program could be started in Oakland, uh, perhaps through um, the uh, adopt a spot program, um, which city of Oakland has, uh, as well as you know, working with, with their uh, homeless <coughs> outreach people. So it's just a potential provisional solution for this issue. John, that's a great suggestion. And we're actually uh, working with the Adopt-A-Spot crew on these live streams. So they've been helping us a lot with different bits of information. Great. So I'll definitely talk to Michael over there about great. that. Mike Palmer, so, great, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Um, and just to clarify for the chat, uh, the flood control district speaking is John Steer. And John, if you could, I think somebody might want to reach out to you. So if you could add your email to the chat. Maybe you bet, maybe. we'll do that right now. Say hello. Um, and somebody else, Mary asked, where does the Sausal Creek enter? Where does Sausal Creek enter the estuary? Uh, I know that. That's right by the, uh, literally at the base of the Fruitvale Bridge. It was culverted. If you walk 50 yards, not even 50 yards, 25 yards from the bridge and look down on the estuary embankment, you'll see a big uh, uh, culvert, and that's where Salsal Creek empties, empties out. Uh, we can't really show it over there because um, right now, as I said, it's an encampment area, and it... Oops. Oh, she froze. Uh, she, what she was going to say is we can't really look at it because it's an encampment area, and they're pretty much, they have engulfed that. And as Dennis said, it used to be you know, that it just fanned out. It didn't really have like one solid end. It just fanned out like a big alluvial fan, which means, you know, as the water comes down, it literally just makes this huge fan down at the water side. And it, it was just marshes and uh, yeah, and beautiful um, willow groves. Um, but that is where it comes out now, culverted. And I don't know if Mark is still on the line, but there was a question from Linda a bit back wondering about the plan for the Army Corps of Engineers to remove the train bridge at Fruitvale. Mark, are you, are you there? Does anyone know about that? Uh, let me get, let me get Mark on, here, put this on, and tell, what do you know about the plan with the Army Corps of Engineers to remove the bridge? Nothing. We don't know about that. All right. Um, I, I know a little bit. Go for okay. it. Yeah, we haven't heard, Mark didn't know about that and we have, none of this crew has heard of that. Yeah, so, yeah, I, so Linda Valley asked the question and I also help monitor the peregrines and I live in Alameda and I know that there are definitely plans and so we're trying to work with the Alameda City Council to um, at least say they can, they have to take into account the nesting season of the peregrines. So they have to do it sort of between like May and September, if they're gonna be doing it to not disrupt so that the birds can nest in a new place, <laughs> probably in the old, um, I think glass cement factory that's just over on Alameda Avenue by the other side of the bridge, so. I thought that was gonna be developed into a shopping center. Well, yeah, we heard rumors of that too. So I don't know where the peregrines will go, but. It's too bad they just couldn't leave one tower as a, uh homage to the uh, Falcons and to the old architecture. Yeah, so maybe keep an eye open for some of the council meetings in Alameda going forward. All right. Good Thank to you. Know. Well, does anybody else have any burning questions? So it's Linda again. I noticed also not too long ago, there used to be sort of a, a platform uh, on the Oakland side of the Fruitvale Bridge where um, people used to fish there. And I think that was removed. I don't know if you know about that um, and what kind of fish they might have been getting from the from the estuary. Yeah, that was a uh, a fishing pier that was uh, pretty well eaten out at the uh, waterline, and the uh, option was to repair it or take it out. And these days, they're more likely to take things out. Uh, we're here at the shoreline, and a guy just reeled in two leopard sharks 
uh, people would catch um, striped bass, uh, skate, and uh, smelt in season coming up on there. But yeah, it was a great uh, public access uh, to the shoreline uh, that was removed about uh, eight, eight, maybe last year, with no plans to replace it. I have a question. All right. Did the Olone eat the uh, eat raw oysters? Did the Olone eat raw oysters? Yes. As a as a, uh, as a ritual. Hi, it's, uh, it's Dennis. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, you asked about the Olone eating raw oysters that they did, and they not only died, but they they uh, it was part of a uh, part of a ritual that they that they went through. It was it was something that they valued so much that um, they would farm them out of the bay and then whatever they could farm, they would eat them a lot of times ritually. And this explains uh, to a large extent why the, why the shell mounds are so sacred or sacred enough that they, were, that they bury people in the shell mounds. Wow, yum. That sounds, that sounds yeah. delicious. Well, thank you so much to all of the speakers and Elizabeth for organizing this. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for hanging in there. You know, while we're doing these live streams um, out in the field, there's ten, there, you know, there happens, there sometimes happens to be some technical difficulties, but thank you all for rolling with it. Um, and this is part of a much larger program um, called Walking Water Hoods. And I just linked the, uh, the website. So this is one of, of a much larger series. Um, we'll have two more, uh, two more tours around Sossel Creek. Um, and we would love to invite you to join them as well. And Holy H2O and Green Breath Alliance are both local nonprofit organizations and 100% of the donations fund the work that we do to protect this beautiful place we call home. I've also linked um, uh, websites on how to donate to us. And so wait, I can't see your links. Did you send them to everybody or just one person? Oh, can you guys not see my links? Has nobody been seeing my links this whole time? Hmm. How about links? She signed, you saying goodbye. Um, Great. She mentioned links and then somebody was asking how come she didn't get the links. I don't know who it was. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I will send them via email because it appears that I cannot send links to everyone. Um, oh, no. I've been chatting with you guys this whole time. Okay. Well, see, follow up with an email from us. And yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your afternoon. Right. Thanks for visiting Salsal Creek with us. See you Thanks on you the next live stream. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone.